You're right in D.C. with Gail Trotter. This is Gail Trotter, host of Right in D.C. Today, our guest is Jim Pinkerton. He's a columnist, author, and political analyst. You can read his work at The American Conservative and Breitbart. He's a grad of Stanford University, and he served on the White House staff under both Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, and worked on each of their presidential campaigns for 1980 and 1992. He also was a senior advisor to the Mike Huckabee 2008 presidential campaign. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, uh, Thank you, Gail. Thanks for having me. I am so delighted to have you on because you are an expert on some of the topics that are near and dear to my heart. I have been working on the Obamacare issue since it was first just a glimmer in President Obama and the Congress's eyes. And we had an interesting decision out of Texas recently. And I'm curious, you have been involved in a lot of the thinking on Obamacare. How do you think this ruling is going to affect the debate on health care going forward? Uh, uh, to be honest, I think it's going to energize the Democrats. Uh, you know, I think uh, the Republicans made a, a huge bet in 2010 and 2014 that the country would hate Obamacare, and they were right at the time. I mean, uh, uh, the polls showed that, and the Republicans won huge victories. Uh, in the years since, as some gloomy conservative said uh, people would get to like it and that's what's happening and uh, uh, I think the cons- conservatives are going to have to come to grips with the fact that uh, people do want health insurance and you know you, it, they would be much better off picking at the side parts of Obamacare such as paying for abortion and sex change operations um, and leaving the basic structure of helping the middle and working class get health insurance and leave that alone. Uh, I mean, the 2018 elections were a pretty, as I've written for Breitbart just a couple of days ago, it was a pretty punishing experience to see health care as the number one issue in the country. Uh, Democrats enjoying 20 or 30 point advantages on the health care issue and the GOP losing the nationwide vote by eight points in the House, you know, uh, how many more experiences like that do we want? Do you think that resulted from the failure of Congress and President Trump to completely root out Obamacare from the very beginning of his term when he made it one of his signature issues, uh, and Republicans have continued to make this a signature issue in order to gain the majority of the House in 2010, the majority of the Senate in 2012, and the majority, and obviously the presidency. Do you think that it was a miscalculation on the part of Congress and President Trump to not deliver on the full type of engagement on uh, repealing and overturning and replacing, I guess, Obamacare and well, not this half measure. Is, they never had a replacement. And, you know, so <clears throat> they could never get it, they could never get it through the Congress. Uh, they never had a replacement. I mean, there's, if, if you start with the proposition that <clears throat> everybody should have health insurance, if, if you do, and it, you could even limit to citizens as opposed to non-citizens. If you start with that proposition, then what you come up with ends up looking like a national health insurance system. And it doesn't have to, you can call it Trump care as opposed to Obamacare, but it will look like, you know, uh, okay, you, you have, here's your card or your app and it says health care on it. And you go to the hospital and you get covered. I mean, it, it, either you bite the bullet on that or you don't. And if you don't, the voters say, well, gee, we'd rather have somebody who will do it for us. And that's the story of the 18 elections. And so, uh, again, I wouldn't find to change the name to Trump Care. We hate Obamacare. Long live Trump Care. 
we just got rid of abortions and sex change operations and, you know, whatever goes along with death panels or something. And then done that. I think people would have loved that. Uh, and I think the Republicans would have done much better in the 18 election. Related to that, you've talked a lot about innovation in healthcare. How do you think this type of federally mandated system of health care will affect the innovation in the field of uh, medical developments? Well, I, I mean, it's, yeah, uh, you, right. It, it's certainly the case that people, as they think about going to the doctor, the first thought they have in their head is not, hey, I can go into the doctor to, to, to deal with, to get reimbursed on my health insurance. You, the first thought you have in your head is, I'm going to the doctor to get better or to have my kids get better. Uh, uh, so, you know, it, it, if there's a cure for what's wrong with you, you're much better off as a patient than if the doctor says, well, gee whiz, we can't, we can't do anything for you, but at least your visit here is paid for. Uh, you know, so, you know, when polio was a big deal back in the 30s, 40s, and, and, and 50s, you know, again, the fact that you might have had health insurance to cover your polio uh, uh, didn't, wasn't nearly as valuable to you as the thought that there could be a polio vaccine that would make polio essentially disappear. Right. And so when you when you read about the cost of, for example, Alzheimer's these days, you know, which is a, you know, $25 trillion hit on the economy by uh, cumulatively by mid-century, $25 trillion. Uh, uh, you think to yourself, gee, that there ought to be a better way to uh, deal with uh, Alzheimer's than what they're doing in Europe, where they're just creating whole new villages now in France and places just to deal with people with Alzheimer's. They're just people can wander around, <laughs> you know, in, in a daze. <laughs> practically, of course, and just live out their, you know, uh, uh, sad lives. That's that's not a very good outcome. And the fact that you have health insurance is kind, but it's not uh, uh, nearly as good as having a solution. And so when you read that 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 now there's a new disease, you know, uh, sort of a polio-like thing <clears throat> that's you know it's going around. It's clearly out of <clears throat> the polio family. And it afflicted 116 Americans uh, this year. And who knows what it will do next year. Uh, again, a, a treatment for that, insurance for that, is not nearly as valuable uh, as an actual cure or some kind of you know, profound vaccine or therapy. And so the question of where that innovation comes from, uh, actually, on this score, the federal government's track record is pretty good. If you look at if you look at the polio vaccine, if you look at uh, the efforts to eradicate malaria and yellow fever and uh, smallpox, uh, <clears throat> hookworm, uh, you can point to a lot of diseases where federal intervention was pretty was extremely was decisive. In fact, uh, you know it doesn't take a genius to figure out that uh, uh, if there is a profound population wide problem. Uh, typhus, typhoid, you know, any of these kind of diseases, you usually need a systemic approach like a nationwide vaccine or a nationwide NIH. Uh, you know, God bless anybody who's got the deep pockets to pay for that out of his or her own philanthropic pocket. Uh, but uh, I, I'd rather have, you know, uh, the government saying that you can't uh, use trial lawyers to destroy uh, you know, again, the, the polio vaccine, never, which, which was released in 1956, never would have happened if the trial lawyers had been allowed to eat it up. That's a great point. And I think we can all agree about the trial lawyers uh, preventing a lot of innovation and being a huge drag on the economy. Uh, something else you raised popped another topic into my mind related to this. We see in Europe, you were talking about the Alzheimer's towns where people are allowed to just wander around safely. Uh, I think there is definitely an understanding that as government becomes more and more in control of healthcare, that there will be economic restraints on what will be 
be allowed to be delivered. And it seems like in Europe that went hand in hand with this development of a euthanasia regime where we saw that originally the water was tested by saying that terminally ill people could in, could work with doctors for mercy killing or euthanasia. Obviously, over the last few years, that has been expanded where people who are not terminally ill have decided that the quality of their lives has declined so much that in desperation, they turn to these doctors as well to terminate their lives. And we have seen a lot of reporting. I, I don't know how accurate it is. I haven't chased it down, but there has been a lot of reporting about how there have been abuses in the system, people who are not terminally ill, who are young children, uh, who are pressured into this. That has certainly been a complaint about Obamacare. And you mentioned that Republicans would do well to attack the side parts of Obamacare, the abortion funding, the sex change funding, and I think you mentioned death panels as well. But I think we're seeing this as a challenge born of experience in Europe that maybe we are not prepared to handle in the United States. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it, it's certainly not popular. I mean, look, there, there's something going on in the sort of post-Christian uh, technocratic view of the world that seems you know, pretty common in the United States as well as Europe. Uh, in Europe, uh, the death panelists, if you will, ha have sort of you know, penetrated into the healthcare system and they say, look, this is a matter of tidying things up, you know, sort of ethically and budget-wise, we will simply kill off you know, granny and grandpa. And that's, that's uh, I, not that is what's going on in Europe, and I don't think it's popular even in Europe. I think it's unpopular. I think this is a case where the government has arrogated itself unto itself a, a lot of power, and I would love to be on the other side of a death panelist in America in terms of the politics, you know, to which Sarah Palin, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, uh, it's it just isn't popular. I mean, but it comes from a mindset, and this is what's so disturbing to me about the current healthcare debate, is that all the experts, including on the right, have a mantra that we're spending too much on healthcare. And therefore, if you have to spend less, you wind up looking for economies and saving money. And that tends to take people of a certain mindset toward, you know, killing off you know, granny and grandpa, uh, just as a, a as a utilitarian uh, a budget saving device. And I mean, my own observation is that, that actually people want to spend more on health care. Health is pretty important. Health of your family is pretty important. Uh, and it's just not obvious to me why we should spend less as opposed to more. Uh, and if you spend more, then you have more money to, to take care of people. And I think people would like that. I think people would vote for that. However, we also have to recognize that there's a weird kind of eugenics and population culling going on. If people are rationed by insurance companies, I think the insurance companies, the private insurance companies are just as capable of making a hard nosed choice about spending less on somebody and letting them die off. As is, as is some bureaucracy. It's, it's not, to me, a public-private thing. It's just simply a case of if you, have, if you choose to live within a budget limit, then you have to make choices. Right, and that underlines the point that it's not just euthanasia, it's also rationing of health care. So talking about these number issues, I want to switch gears a little bit here and go into tax reform. You have spent a lot of um, brain power and part of your ability to discuss in the public public arena information about tax reform and the corporate tax reform, as I have as well. We are, I guess, a year out from the major tax bill being passed by President by Congress and signed by President Trump. 
and you have done a lot of thinking and writing on corporate tax reform. So I'm curious what your analysis is of where we are now after this and what you would like to see the Congress and President Trump move towards, which might be impossible given that the Democrats control the House now. But if you if it were a perfect world and you could push policy in one direction, what would you recommend? Well, I mean, it's quite true. I worked uh, uh, for, uh, you know, and still do to some extent on behalf of the rate coalition reforming America's taxes equitably, which is a group dedicated to getting the U.S. corporate tax rate down to a internationally competitive level. At the time we started back in 2011, we were at 35 percent, which was the highest rate in the industrialized world. And uh, finally, in 2017, we managed to, I mean, the Congress did that is, and President Trump, to get it to, down to 21, which is about a little bit below, but only a little tiny bit below uh, the, the OECD average. So, you know, all, all we did, and it was important, was to get the U.S. from the least competitive tax code, corporate tax code, to a little bit better than the, the herd, as, as it were. Uh, and we were quite pleased, and I think the results speak for themselves in terms of you know, greater economic growth and, and, and so on. Uh, however, there, there is you know, uh, uh, more to be done. And, and you know, one area you know, that, that I've thought a lot about is how do you, in terms of increasing economic growth, is how do you get uh, uh, the greater utilization of natural resources? I mean, it's, it's astounding to me that we have, again, we're shifting here from uh, corporate taxes, that we have several hundred trillion dollars, trillion, hundred trillion of oil, natural gas, and coal uh, that we're not using. Uh, you know, this is, this is many multiples of the U.S. Uh, GDP and the U.S. national debt, and not to mention the deficit or the annual budget. We're looking at vast, a, a plethora of, of wealth and resources that we're, that we're choosing not to use. Now, of course, any, anytime you mention carbon-based fuels, you get discussions of climate change. Well, right. I, as I've also written a great deal on, uh, we, could, we could capture that carbon if we wanted to. We, we could have clean uh, carbon fuels that don't contribute to the atmos atmospheric uh, uh, climate change. And I, I count myself personally as an agnostic on that subject, but if, it's a big, if it is a big deal, uh, the same techno technological ingenuity that we've shown when we wanted to over the last hundred years from you know, synthetic rubber to the atomic bomb to the polio vaccine, uh, we, could, we could be using. Uh, uh, the opportunities to capture carbon are enormous. Uh, I just had a tweet just yesterday about uh, if the oceans are warming, that makes for more coral. And coral yes, I is, saw that. You know, well, coral is calcium carbonate. Coral is carbon capture. So if you if, if you had more coral, uh, you'd have more carbon. And the oceans con oceans contain or sequester that infinitely more carbon than does the atmosphere, and so does the soil. So do trees. So do frankly just about anything in our physical environment has a has a carbon basis to it, which is to say it's it's a carbon sink. S S I N K, and so we could be doing. We could unleash, you know, uh, again, hundreds and hundreds of trillions of dollars. And this is not just the United States, by the way. This is the world, and this is why, if I were the Greens, if I were the Al Gore and the environmentalists, I'd be saying, look, if our plan, and I've written about a lot about this for American conservatives, if our plan is to try to tax or restrict or ration energy use so that people use less carbon. Uh, we'll never know whether it works or not because we'll be voted out of office. Right. And, and, I mean, that, that's, you know, whether it's, it's, you know, Macron in France these days or, you know, built, or Barack Obama's cap and trade in 2009 or Al Gore's DTU tax back in 1993 or Jimmy Carter's energy rationing back in 1977, people hate it. People hate this stuff. And if the Greens were smart, you know, and, and truly interested in reducing CO2 as opposed to some other agenda, 
uh, they'd be saying, yeah, if, if there's some technological fix that would enable, you know, everybody in the country to get a check from the government for $5,000 a year, like they do in Alaska, or potentially do in Alaska, I think that would be a lot better and, and be a lot more politically sustainable than simply going to war against everybody's automobile and lawnmower. Yeah, the war against cars doesn't seem that successful a platform, but I, it is interesting in relation to young people, they tend not to want to get their driver's licenses quickly. They tend to use a lot of other transportation available to them, like Uber or whatever. And I, I feel like that's an interesting generational shift that I was not expecting. Do you feel like like that plays it, into it is these it is i mean yes people don't tend to drive but when it's not that they don't rely on cars it's that they don't buy a car you can use the, the automobile as a service to wit uber and lyft and so on is a, a, an incredible phenomenon and a tribute to human creativity and entrepreneurship and ingenuity and all that uh it 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 doesn't speak to anybody's desire to take mass transit and I mean, I, I have no objection. I have no criticism, Master. I take the metro system here all, and here in D.C. all the time. But oftentimes, you know, it's just not convenient. And U what Uber has done, and you know, and it's now just is now spreading to the car companies. It's just reading about Volvo is now saying, if you just give us, you know, 400 months, we'll get you a car whenever you need it. You know, it, it's it's sort of this automobile as a service idea does cut against traditional car ownership, but it doesn't cut against, tradi against traditional car ridership, as in, I, I, I don't really, a, a hub and spoke transportation system isn't nearly as valuable to me as point to point. I don't need to get to the Farragut West Metro Station. I need <laughs> to get to 1801K Street. Right, right. That's so true. Well, Related to kind of cultural disruptions that we've had in the past year of 2018, I kept seeing this writer and college professor Jordan Peterson referenced by people that I follow on Twitter. And so I went out and bought his book, listened to it, and then I was so fascinated by it I bought a ticket to his DC performance at the Warner Theater, and it was quite a revelation. I saw that you have tweeted some, retweeted some of Jordan Peterson's comments on Twitter, and I'm curious what you think is driving his popularity, what you think is good in his message, what's maybe not so good, and why do you think there is a hunger for his kind of message in 2018? Well, I mean, Peterson is quite a phenomenon. I mean, I, I oftentimes say, you know, it, it'll be clear in the next 100 years or so whether he's another Martin Luther in terms of just his impact on orthodoxy. Uh, in this case, politically correct orthodoxy, uh, it, it, it could well be. And I think the whole movement of Peterson and the online publication Quillette uh, has been an amazing and very heartening phenomenon. I, 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 the way I look at it is <clears throat> it is a kind of a victory for what psychologists and uh, brains or brain experts call you know the right brain versus the left brain. It's 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 a somewhat notional thought that your right brain, the the right hemisphere of your brain, is associated with creativity and spontaneity, and art and music and so on. And the left brain is associated with sort of order and structure and design. And to say it that way, left brain, right brain is they're obviously both vital. Uh, but you, you can also see how, you know, and it's sort of true, just as we observe the people around us, that some people have a dominant left brain and some people have a dominant right brain. And to me, I see, and I've, and I've written about this for American Conservative, going back to a discussion of why the BBC was banning Monty Python, uh, uh, the left brain side of things, which is order and structure, but has a way of sort of bleeding into political correctness and frankly totalitarianism <laughs> has gained ascendancy uh, in our culture vastly 
augmented by computers, which are about as left brain as you can get, and it is threatening to crush the kind of you know uh, creativity and unorthodoxy and imagination and you know freedom uh, that the right brain is associated with. And so I see I see Peterson uh, as a right brain figure uh, fighting against the empire, uh, and it is. You know, it's far as just as it was with Martin Luther in 1519, give or take. It's not obvious to me who's going to win this fight, but I'm certainly rooting for uh, uh, Peterson just as a a voice of, look, let's be free. Now, now of course, having said that, I mean Peterson is also about a kind of personal order and a personal. Yes. Order, starting with his famous point about make your bed, uh, uh, but it, it's still a larger. Right, and again, you you only survive in this world if you have some kind of personal order in your own life. But what you don't want is to be told what to do, and you want to think of that stuff. You know, it's it's the Burkean point: you should be free to do what you should do. And but freedom is not anarchy. Freedom is doing the right thing. Um, and so I I think Peterson is a tremendous figure, and uh, fortunately there are many like him these days, and. Uh, I, I think that on behalf of humanity, we should wish them well. That's so interesting that you raised the point about cleaning the room, making the bed. And that's what I was thinking as you were detailing what kind of a figure he is and how he challenges the orthodoxy. I was thinking a lot of the criticism of him is that he is too orderly and that he hearkens back to this patriarchal order, which has been rooted out or is in the process of being rooted out. And the only problem with our society right now is that we have not rooted out the patriarchy enough. So I find it quite fascinating that you see him as such a creative, right-brained figure when so much of the criticism leveled at him that I have seen in interviews done with him think pieces against him in various illustrious publications seem to be criticizing him for just the opposite. And I think that's a really profound insight that you have had that might change how people view him if they're willing to hear that message. Well, every unit has to be able to sustain itself, whether it's an individual or a, you know, a, a choral polyp or a family or a tribe or a village it has to survive and you only survive by sort of organizing yourself into some sort of sustainable model and so peterson tells teenage males kind of it seems like that's kind of his core audience or at least 20 something young males at least look you're not going to make it young man if you are on opioids or you know pornography or whatever, you're just not going to make it. You're going to wind up dead or, you know, living in your parents' basement the rest of your life. Uh, and so you have to get your, you know, bleep together enough to function in the world. Now, once you do that, once you've sort of proven that you are mature, then you ought to have the right to make your own choices and not get sucked into or get ordered around by some idiotic, Canadian system about you know gender pronouns and stuff. I mean, in other words, yes, the the it is it is paradoxical that the PC left and it's nowhere stronger it seems than in Canada says in the name of freedom you must do X Y and Z, and then and then by the way A B C D E and F and and in other words, it's it, it it look everything's complicated so but the conservative in us if I can speak broadly says in self, you know, it's it's right out of the song America, uh, redeem thy soul and self-control. Uh, uh, that's that's sort of the Peterson message, and, but in that case, it's, you know, whoever it was, uh, uh, you know, Julie Ward Howe or somebody, uh, you know, 100 years ago with the song, uh, the anthem. And so it, it, it's basic conservative wisdom that you have to, you know, be able to tie your shoelaces and stand up and stand up straight and so on. But then once you've done that, then you should have uh, rights and privileges to uh, 
live according to your own conscience within, of course, a larger framework of, you know, human decency. We seem to have that just completely flipped in our society right now. I don't know about Canadian society, but certainly in American society, this failure to launch, the inability of young people to really start on the ladder towards you know, independence, and we have the opposite of very rigid, controlled thinking, not from the government, but from, I guess, societal or cultural pre- uh, prejudices and pressures. So I find that very interesting. And related to that, I had seen that you had tweeted about the Financial Times picking George Soros as man of the year. And I had read a separate article talking about how his organization had funded an organization that had uh, basically disrupted Attorney General Pam Bondi of Florida while she was at the theater, I think, with her husband or her family. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on the Financial Times selecting George Soros as their man of the year. Well, every, every publication has its heroes, right? And, uh, you know, to, to the Financial Times readership, Soros as a, you know, billionaire, a many, many billionaire, uh, tycoon, you know, globalist, financialist, everything, that's, that's everything the Financial Times admires. Uh, and the fact that he like, likes to beat down nation states and so on, and conservatives, they, 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 all the more reason to love him, right? I mean, that's what... Right. Again, Republican Republicans in America have to get their heads around the fact that most billionaires are what, whatever party they belong to. They just have a common view of sort of paving over or not paving over, plowing under, uh, you know, nation states and tribes and ethnicities and habits and cultures and so on. And, and in the name of being able to to either mandate, you know, gay bathrooms everywhere or just simply sell, you know, more consumer products or both. And so, you know, Soros fits right into the Financial Times worldview. Now, the the joke of that Financial Times article, though, was that if you actually read it, it was sort of guarded and and it it was almost, I almost got the feeling that the FT was trolling a little bit as like, you know, like this, <laughs> you think we're a bunch of plutocrat globalists. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to take the arch plutocrat, plutocrat globalist George Soros and make him our man of the year just to kind of get cheeky here. And yet within the article, and this is what I noted in my tweet, they have Soros, they quote Soros saying that the European Union as it exists today reminds him a lot of the old Soviet Union, which is not exactly a compliment. Right. On any number of different levels, in, including as an assessment of its survival prospects. Right, the Soviet Union collapsed, and I, you know, who knows what's going to happen to the EU. But I, it certainly seems as though the kind of Emmanuel Macron, Jean Claude Juncker vision of the EU as a United States of Europe is not going to happen. Uh, so again, I, I'll, I'll give the Financial Times credit for kind of a, a wink as it were, even as they celebrated somebody who I do not admire at all. That is a very fair point. It also reminds me of some article I was reading recently talking about how Democrats and folks, partisans on the left, support media, even though it's not uh, financially beneficial to them, but they will continue to support voices in the public square that are advancing leftist type policies and yet for some reason people on the right slash republicans are not interested in funding media unless they can make a profit out of it or at least break even and that puts people on the right slash conservatives at a disadvantage to get their views out there to the same level that people on the left are able to get their views out in the public debate. Yeah, I I think that the Republicans don't lack for fat cat donors who write enormous checks to, you know, campaign consultants and to buy TV ads. I I think, frankly, it's, it's much smarter 
to get ahead of the campaign season. And so if for a senator who has a six year cycle, rather than spend, you know, a hundred million dollars in the last three months of his or her term as he as he or she seeks to get reelected, instead spend it on arranging for positive media for the entirety of the six year term that he or she is in. I, I think that's much smarter. I think, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at people, at, there's so much TV advertising or other advertising at, in, in a campaign, you know, here in D.C., I can remember just turning on the local news and seeing 10 minutes of political ads, including three for Larry Hogan in, in one block. One time, <laughs> the, the Republican Governor Bennett, I mean, I'm delighted Hogan was one, but nonetheless, it was sort of obviously, you know, overkill to see three ads for the same guy. Right. Uh, I, I think it's much more valuable to to have the the way the Washington Post treats you know Tim Kaine or Mark Warner or whoever as just oh this is a wonderful thoughtful statesman who we're lucky to have uh, representing us. I think that as sort of the the background music of a politician's career is much more valuable than just a, a blitz of 30 second ads every every two, four or six years. So yeah, I think the, the left is much smarter on, on a purely dollars and cents basis to be supporting the New York Times and the Washington, I mean, the Washington Post. I mean, you know, these, these publications, the Washington Post is a perfect example. Washington Post doesn't make money, but Jeff Bezos doesn't care. You know, it, it, it's he, he could he could buy it for he can buy it he can hire new reporters and you know and, and I see that now that Time Magazine Mark Benioff another Silicon Valley billionaire it's just bought Time Magazine he's hiring I just read somewhere 25 new reporters the, the the Time Magazine business model hasn't gotten any better in the last year since Benioff bought it what's gotten better for Time Magazine is Benioff was simply willing to dip into his pocket and spend money to hire reporters. And, you know, we can only guess what those reporters are going to be, you know, writing and talking about and, and so on and so on. So, yeah, I think uh, if we think that the MSM is, you know, stacked, you know, 20 to 1 against us, and it is, uh, we should be doing something about it. I'm reminded of what Peter Drucker said, you know, the, the best way to control the future is to make it yourself. And so if, you know, uh, uh, we can point to, you know, uh, conservative libertarian, not libertarian, not, but conservative media outlets that we like, and say, gee, if only there were more of those, or bigger, or uh, uh, or more aggressive, or whatever the you know whatever the category be. I mean, you know, it's it's in, in, including things that are really expensive to do, like investigative reporting. It, it's easy to get up and say, I hate liberals, I hate political correctness, and that's that's got to you know a very low ceiling utility to it. What's really kind of profound is to say that I'm going to investigate something and discover, the, you know, the real truth of it. And, and, and that, you know, whether it's, you know, the Mueller investigation or, or, you know, the workings of George Soros, I mean, you know, just, there should be another 20 books and documentaries just about Soros. I mean, you know, I mean he, he's, if he's giving away, you know, a billion dollars a year, and and and, for, and has been for for decades. That's an infinity of expenditures that ought to get chased down. I mean, you, you just look at one group that he's given money to, the Drug Policy Institute. I just was reading somewhere that he gave the Drug Policy Institute or Alliance sixty-two million dollars. I think it was in twenty fourteen. And you look at what the Drug Policy Alliance stands for. It's not just marijuana legalization. It's not just free syringes to junkies. It's not just uh, de-incarceration of, of drug criminals. It's also they hate drug enforcement worldwide. I mean, they, they really do, it appears, support drug legalization, including cocaine and heroin and, you know, every meth, meth and everything. And if every, if, if every ordinary citizen understood that this giant donor, not only the liberal causes, but also to the Democratic Party, was in favor of legalizing hard drugs, I think, for one thing, every every Democratic politician would flee, would say, I, I can't accept any money from this person. 
I have to return all my campaign donations from him and anybody like him. Uh, and then meanwhile, you go to work and just saying, look, is it good public policy to spend a fortune, including in races, you know, subtle races, like you mentioned, attorneys general and so on. Is it good public policy to have people like that running around? The answer would be no. And I think that things would change. But, you know, as Francis Bacon said 400 years ago, knowledge is power. And if you don't have the knowledge, you don't have much power. That is an excellent point. And I feel like I follow this stuff pretty closely, but I had never heard that before. So you did me a service and I think all the listeners to learn that aspect of George Soros and also the idea that these types of investments in different policy organizations create a vulnerability that could be capitalized by libertarian or conservative organizations being able to get the information, just like the unvarnished information out to the American people. This has popped a Another topic into my mind about the shutting down of the Weekly Standard. I don't know if you have any views on that, but uh, certainly the Weekly Standard had a lot of my friends who were employed by them. They did a lot of excellent analysis of different things. Uh, They were criticized a lot, too, and they uh, were seen as being against the administration, um, sometimes rabidly so, maybe more so in the TV interviews of their founder and the head of their organization, and maybe less so on the actual pages. I don't know. That's hard to weigh. But I'm curious if you have any reaction to the weekly standard being shut down. Well, I mean, some of the writers there, like Andy Ferguson and Matt Labash. Are geniuses, and and I hope yeah. they uh, <clears throat> continue, uh, you know, writing clever, funny, witty, insightful profiles and everything else they do. And 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 they they look the, the publication has lots of good book reviews and things like that. However, you know, uh, on its tombstone will not be oh they have some good writers. On its tombstone will be they were the architects of the Iraq War, one of the, about the biggest disaster. Uh, that's befallen America in the last half century, and that was them, and that was no way around it. And so, you know, it, 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 I, I have to admit, <clears throat> I lament more uh, the 5,000 Americans who were killed and the 30,000 that were crippled and the seven trillion that we spent <clears throat> on the Iraq War uh, than I do the passing of the magazine. I guess that probably puts my cards down on that one. That is an excellent answer, and maybe we'll have to have you back for another interview discussion about the Iraq War, but since that's a huge topic, I'm going to just move on to the next one. Uh, This is my final topic to talk with you about. As I mentioned in my introduction of you, you worked in the George H.W. Bush administration, and I had the distinct honor to attend George H.W.'s service at the National Cathedral. I understand that you did as well. I'm sure you paid attention to a lot of the commentary pro and con about President Bush's time in office and the legacy that he left us. I'm curious, since you worked in the White House under President George H.W. Bush, do you have any insights or reflections that you think were not covered by the commentary about him that we would be well served to hear about? Well, I, I, I'm not sure about insights, but reflections. I, mean, I, I worked for him actually beginning in 1985. So I worked for him from 1985 to 1992. So that's what, eight years, seven years. Um, look, he was a, a thoroughly admirable man, uh, you know, married to the same woman for. 72 years, I think, uh, uh, you know, big family, uh, good, 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 loving father and grandfather, and I think great grandfather, uh, m- much, much a war hero. And I, and I wrote a piece about him focusing on, you know, you know, not everybody, you know, jumped at the chance to join the U.S. Navy in 1942 in the middle of the war, uh, you know, just as, as he did. And, you know, uh, and I also, you know, uh, made the point that had, you know, movies like, uh, had a book like Tom Brokaw's The Greatest Generation or a movie like Saving Private Ryan come out 10 years before, 
uh, Bush would have won a landslide in not only 1988, but also 1992. In other words, the, the culture did change in a good way on that in terms of reflecting on the heroism of the World War II generation, which when Bush was 41 was in active politics, they knew about the war stuff, but it just wasn't a big deal. I mean, I was, I was around for that and people, in part because so many of them, others were war heroes too, although not Dukakis or, or certainly not Bill Clinton. Um, Bush as president, uh, you know, you, you have to say that the ending the Cold War was a great triumph. It didn't have to work out well, but it did. Uh, his handling of the Kuwait uh, war was was well, including the decision not to go to Iraq, <clears throat> go into Iraq was was well handled. Uh, um, you know, on the on the downside, <clears throat> the, the, the breaking the pledge on taxes was just frankly stupid. And I, I was there at the time, and I said so. <clears throat> I said if you break your pledge to raise taxes, you will crack up your coalition, and you know, and, and lose. And he did. <clears throat> he, he got Pat Buchanan as the primary challenger. Uh, he got Ross Perot coming into the race as an independent, saying that all politicians are liars. And it's it's kind of amazing that to say all politicians are liars, that statement hurt Bush 41 more than it hurt Bill Clinton, who's much more <laughs> of a liar by nature. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, like a lot of people, Bush, you know, certainly on on the ledger on Bush 41, his the positive side is much much greater than the negative side. But uh, you know, it, it only takes one bad mistake to as you know, Shakespeare and every and Oedipus and all those other tragic figures prove, it only takes one bad mistake to to uh, knock you out, and that's what Bush, that's what Bush forty one did to himself. Um, did you notice? Trump would say, "Sad." Sorry. Did you notice during one of the tributes? I think it was Simpson who talked about that very moment in the Bush presidency where he was trying to decide whether to go back on his promise not to raise taxes. And Simpson went into detail about it and said, we came to him, we came to him, and we asked him to to agree with us on this bipartisan bill. And it was interesting because I think Simpson listed the things that were in the bill in an effort to show how important it was. And the things that he listed in the bill, maybe it was Social Security, Medicaid funding. I can't even remember what they were. But at the time when he was saying it during the funeral service, I thought, boy, that's not really helping your argument because those things are not significant enough in the minds of anybody listening to this to think, oh, well, that was leadership where it was, you know, Pearl Harbor was struck and we had to break the no, no new taxes pledge or, you know, 9-11 or, or something else, some, some big dramatic thing that the Congress and the president had to act immediately or, you know, there would be doom and devastation. Did you notice that in his tribute as well? I did. I, I, I wrote about it for Breitbart, as a matter of fact, and I took note of Simpson's uh, eulogy, which looked to me more like a, a weird kind of policy defense. I'll admit, I have never, ever been a fan of Alan Simpson. <laughs> um, he's funny, but that's not a virtue in politics compared to not being destructive. Uh, uh, and, and it was revealing to me that the Bush family, which I'm sure had you know pretty good control over what was being set up there, wanted Simpson to get up there and defend the 1990 budget deal which just for the sake of people who don't, either don't remember or are too young to have known about it, a after the tax increase of 19, the pledge breaking tax increase of 1990, spending went up, the deficit went up, economic growth went down. A everything they said it would fix got worse. It was just, it was just on its own terms, a disastrous, bad deal for the Republicans. And the fact that the Bush family wanted Simpson to get up and defend it, I, I you know, it, it's not as if all the Bush, you know, Jeb Bush, George Bush, uh, George P. Bush, uh, they're not all tax increases. That's not the case. I think in their mind, family loyalty required them to defend every last thing that, that Bush 41 did. 
and uh, you know, it it puts a shadow on you know the Bush political future that they sort of see this politics as an exercise in defending family honor, uh, as opposed to thinking about what's best for the country. I'd rather you know, if I, looking to a politician, I'd rather see that I want to, that they they're here to make the country better, as opposed to redeem the family name. So yeah, I, I think that was enormously revealing <laughs> that they chose that moment to defend this catastrophic budget deal in such intricate detail. I think you raise a, a really good point that those family loyalties can distort politics and policy, and I think. It's interesting that we continue to see the Bush family being involved in politics, the Clinton family being involved in politics, obviously the Kennedy family continuing to be involved in politics. Uh, what do you think the pitfalls of that are for uh, what what's in Americans' interests? Well, I mean, look, dynasties, you know, uh, are a common enough thing. Just about every big shot in any field from politics to business to whatever wants to see his or her progeny uh, go forward and flourish, often typically in the same line of work, whatever it is, whether it's the military or politics or anything. So, uh, you know, I'm sure the Bush family looks to, for example, George P. Bush, who's the land commissioner of Texas. Yes. As you know, a president as a presidential candidate, and I don't know, twenty, thirty six or so, when he's you know, uh, and you know, who's, and he's got a perfect right to run. Uh, it, it, I think the, from the point of view of the rest of us as voters, we have to say is 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 he would George P. Bush be running on an agenda of whatever optimum policies there are in twenty thirty six or is he running because he thinks the family name requires it? And, uh, you know, again, the family name requiring it is a perfectly valid argument for the Bush family to push him to be a politician. It is not a particularly compelling argument to some ordinary citizen, although I freely admit that, you know, a name brand in politics, whether it's Kennedy or Bush or Clinton or, uh, you know, Rockefeller, gone back a ways, is oftentimes you know, uh, a, a signal to, you know, low information voters that, oh, so-and-so is a Bush, so-and-so is a Kennedy, so-and-so is, you know, a, 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 a whatever family, an Adams, you know, whatever, a Roosevelt, whatever family, uh, they must be good. And uh, uh, I hope the voters always are able to make a, a more discerning choice than that. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. If people want to follow you, what is your handle on Twitter? Uh, James P. Pinkerton, at, at James P., two P's in a row, James P. Pinkerton. And is there anywhere else they should go to? Obviously, Breitbart, American Conservative, probably have author um, uh, author sites or pages for you is there anywhere else that yeah you'd like I, I i not offhand i can think of i mean google google's usually good so you know i mean, I, I you know uh, uh, i wrote a lot for the la times and newsday way back when but uh you know and and you know uh but certainly you'll get this you know plenty of me at either breitbart or american conservative <laughs> and maybe we'll have you back to debate the iraq war <laughs> <laughs> okay, clear enough. All right. Thanks, this Gail. Is, this is Gail Merry Trotter. Christmas. This is Gail Trotter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram, subscribe to this podcast, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and support my work via Patreon. This is Right in DC. You're Right in DC with Gail Trotter. <laughs>